you very much. I want to add my thanks to what David um, offered to the league for inviting us to present today. Um, we have this tag team thing going because, as David mentioned, our organizations work really closely with each other on a regular basis. And so I'm really delighted that I get to present with him today. I'm going to be speaking about some of the um, some of the critical components that are policy tools that are needed to help transition Massachusetts and the region and the country towards this renewable um, energy future, this clean energy future. As David said, it's totally possible. The science tells us we have to do it. Analysis tells us it's cap we're capable of doing it, it's possible. And so now we have to figure out what needs to be put in place to make that happen. So before I do that, I want to tell you a little bit about my organization. So I am the Clean Energy Program Director at Mass Energy Consumers Alliance. We're People's Power and Light in Rhode Island. Uh, we are greening this event this evening, and um, I'm happy to t explain that after the fact. But we are a nonprofit that was founded in 1982. We started out as the Boston Oil Consumers Alliance, which was essentially a, he a discount heating oil service. We're really expert at aggregating consumers, harnessing the purchasing power of consumers, and working to um, create opportunities for affordable, sustainable energy solutions, um, and to provide access to uh, resources and emerging technology to individuals, to households, to communities. We do that in part because we're deeply committed to making sure Massachusetts and Rhode Island reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. We also do it because in addition to providing programs we, uh, to consumers and advocating for environmental solutions, we, um, we want to inform consumers and educate people about the role that they can play in making the transition possible. David noted that a lot of um, what we're talking about when we say we need to make the change happen is about the stuff that we buy. And so we really want to make sure that consumers are making informed decisions when they're purchasing things like an electric vehicle or they're heating their homes or they're pushing their community for a green energy solution. And we do that and that makes individuals like yourselves really effective advocates because you can speak from experience when you're when you're pushing for some of these solutions. So we're pro-consumer, we're pro-environment. Um, we have a discount heating oil service that we provide. We also provide a green power program, which is an opportunity for individuals to purchase 100% renewable in region, um, mostly wind. We have done some programs with solar. I don't know if anybody here is a Mass Energy member. You might be familiar with our, our rights. And if you're not a member, you can become one this evening. Um, we do programs with solar. We are very engaged in energy efficiency advocacy that it, and programming. That is uh, energy efficiency, the cheapest megawatt hour is the one that's not used. <laughs> megawatt is the one that's not used. Um, and advocacy. So uh, this map just kind of shows you where some of our projects are that we purchase clean energy from. They're all in New England. They're mostly in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Um, it's, it, they're all class one resources, and I'll explain what that means. So how do we get to 100% renewable? The first thing is, well, with the Green Power Program, there are individual actions that can be taken. There are local or community actions that can be taken, and there are state level actions that can be taken. So the local is, as I said, choosing how you get your energy, how you use your energy, making sure that you're efficient, making sure that you're um, a mass energy member and, per and, per and using uh, green electricity, um, driving an electric vehicle, installing a heat pump, installing solar, any number of things that you can do as an individual in your home. Locally, you can pursue or encourage your community to pursue something called green municipal aggregation, which I'll go into detail in a little bit, but that's essentially ramping up your commitment to green energy, taking your personal commitment and spreading it out across the community and getting your community to buy green power. And that's particularly important because it is one of the key components of this 100% renewable strategy and the 100% renewable um, sort of checklist that's been created by Mass Power Forward. And then there's the state level action, which um, there's a tool for every job. And when it comes to in, uh, 
getting more renewable energy online, the renewable portfolio standard is the tool for the job. So here in Massachusetts, we have what's called a renewable portfolio standard or an RPS. And it's essentially a requirement that the state's energy or electricity suppliers, so basically our utilities or competitive suppliers, except for municipal light plants, which we can talk about later, um, they have a certain percentage of their supply must be um, provided through qualifying renewable resources. And in Massachusetts, that amount goes up 1% per year. So for example, um, right now in 2017, if you're a National Grid or an Eversource or uh, National Grid or Eversource customer, you, your electricity supply is required to be 12% renewable. <coughs> Wind, solar, anaerobic digestion, uh, landfill gas, it has to be at least 12%. And in 2018, that'll be 13% and then 14% and so on and so forth. If utilities fail to meet this requirement each year, uh, they have to meet it each year. If they fail to meet it, then they have to pay what's called an alternative compliance payment or an ACP payment. Those payments go towards promoting renewable, program, renewable projects, renewable energy um, programs in the state. So there are 29 states in the US that have a renewable portfolio standard. This graph is from the Lawrence Berkeley um, lab out of uh, California. They do a report every year that looks at the impacts of renewable portfolio standards in the country. And um, basically each year they demonstrate that it has been, that RPSs in all the states that have them have been key drivers for renewable energy deployment. They make up a significant portion of um, capacity across the, the country. They, almost all the states that have an RPS have managed to comply with the RPS. I think something that's particularly cool about Massachusetts RPS RPS, though, is that we have a very pure renewable portfolio standard, meaning only certain resources, like the ones I just described, qualify. Uh, that's compared to like um, North Carolina. I like to point to North Carolina. I think that a certain, they have like 3% of their RPS can be met with swine waste or something. They're, they're an agricultural state, so it kind of makes sense. So, um, I mean, it, it does make sense for that reason. It's still kind of gross. Anyway, <laughs> so the goal of the RPS is to bring more renewables online. And I love this graphic that we created. Um, basically, as, more, as uh, more and more resources come online, they displace fossil fuels, which is in important for the greenhouse gas emissions benefits. Um, they create jobs because a lot of these, these projects are going online in our region. Many of them are going online in Massachusetts, but most of them are going online across the region of New England. Um, they can also be in, uh, class one resources can be met from supply in New York as well. Um, they stabilize prices. So right now, you all know, the price volatility of natural gas is just crazy. It goes up, it goes down. You can't predict it. You can't predict where prices are going to be. And so renewables um, help to stabilize prices related to, to fuels and to um, generation. And then again, the um, avoidance of greenhouse gas emissions. This is a table that shows you sort of where some of these projects come from. Because a lot of times when David and I are talking to legislators, they'll say, well, yeah, you want to go 100% renewable, or you want to even increase the RPS. Where are those resources coming from? They can't, and the answer is they can't just be any project. You can't just like suddenly build a turbine in your backyard and try to qualify for the RPS. <laughs> if you get it cited, that'd be one thing, but that's not going to happen. Um, the system that has been implemented to make, um, to ensure compliance with the RPS actually requires projects to be um, approved by the Department of Energy Resources here in Massachusetts, DOER. And then they maintain a, a database of eligible projects. And when a utility has to purchase the renewable energy certificates or the green attribute from a project to demonstrate that they're complying with the law, it has to be from a project on that list. So DOER maintains this list. These are some of the types of projects that would qualify. These are some of the resources that we currently use in Massachusetts to meet that requirement. And you can see there are a number of different resources or technologies on the list. Um, solar, wind, landfill gas, uh, biomass, sustainably harvested biomass in Massachusetts, and anaerobic digestion. 
the RPS as a um, greenhouse gas emissions reduction strategy is key. Where does the current RPS get us? Well, this graph shows you, oh, I should back up and say that the RPS only um, relates to the electric sector. So David indicated that the emissions in the electric sector have consistently come down over the last few years, and that is very important. Right now, emissions from the sector only make up about a fifth of our overall profile, uh, emissions profile in Massachusetts. However, as we electrify more and more sectors to make sure that we can bring down emissions in, say, transportation or space heating, we're going to be calling on the electric sector even more, calling on the grid even more to power our resources, to, to heat our homes and to drive our cars. So the renewable portfolio standard is cleaning up the electric sector and it needs to happen faster. So what this green line is showing you is at our current rate of 1% per year increase in the RPS, by 2050, we'll be at about 45% renewable energy supply. The rest of it is made up of um, natural gas and hydro at that point. If we were to meet our goals for the Clean Energy and Climate Plan, or GWSA, we need to be at least 80% below 1990 levels across all sectors, but especially in the electric sector. So that's what that blue line is. If we were, which basically shows you we're not moving fast enough. We need to make up that gap. So we need to have, we need to find some way to get 35% more CO2 emission reductions out of our electric sector than we currently have. And this is just another graphic that sort of demonstrates how we get there. Um, these are the emissions and the renewable portfolio standard by 2050 will get us to there. So what are the ways that we can ratchet down emissions um, in that sector um, as well? Well, there are a couple. So the voluntary market is, is one way. That's the voluntary green power program. If you purchase green supply or if your community does green municipal aggregation, um, as I said, those are important um, components of the transition plan. Another thing that we're not talking about here today, but that is certainly worth exploring, is public, public sector um, energy procurement. So basically getting the municipal buildings in your community to be powered with 100% renewable resources. There are some really important benefits that are tied to doing that. Um, that are worth exploring. One is that the electricity supply for municipal buildings is also is often much larger than it is just for the residential or small business um, portion of your community. And so there's more opportunity there, for example, to enter into a long-term contract and secure more clean energy for the community at a reduced rate. So it's worth exploring in your community. It's basically just, again, kind of harnessing the purchasing power of a community outside of just the residents. So, um, and then as I mentioned, how do we um, kind of keep track of what this the renewable supply looks like? So what this graphic is showing is right now there are just, our electrons are just kind of floating in the grid. They're out there. There's no way for you to know exactly whether or not the, the, the electron produced from the turbine in your community is actually going into your house. So the way to track that is to put a value on both the electricity that's being created and the green attribute that's being created. And that green attribute is called a renewable energy certificate um, or is, is valued in a re renewable energy certificate. So when we get renewable projects that come online, they put clean, um, clean electrons into the grid. There's a, there's a value for the electron and then the, the REC is the equivalent of one megawatt hour. For every megawatt hour uh, generated, you get a REC. The REC goes into the regional database where they log it and they're like, okay, that clean power happened. If you are purchasing as a community or an individual the green power, then it goes into your home, but you can't take credit for it unless you also claim the REC. Let me explain that a little bit. This gets to the importance of the handout. So the only way for your community to be 100% renewable or fully green, and Mass Energy, we are purists about this, is to make sure that that REC 
That green attribute isn't given away to someone else. We do not want it double counted. So when you, in your community, purchase the green power, you have the ability to also purchase the rec. You want that rec to be put away into another bucket and not sold into the market. All of this, I, I realize this is like, there's a lot to, to take in, but <laughs> basically, Recs are tracked in a regional market. Green attributes are out there floating in a, green, in a market. Utilities have to claim those because they have to comply with the law. We want the RPS to be used to drive demand for more than what the utilities are claiming. The only way to do that is to take that green attribute and keep it away from the utility. <laughs> put it in your pocket, put it in your electric trash can, put it wherever you want, but do not give it back to the utility. And what that does is it requires the utility to go out and purchase someone else's RECs or RECs from another project. And that drives the demand for more renewable projects. This is all driven by the renewable portfolio standard or that state requirement that a certain percentage of electricity supply has to be renewable. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> so you keep the wreck away, from, that's a good question. You keep the wreck away from the utilities because basically they have to be purchased yearly. So there's almost, it's almost as if there's like a sell by date attached to the wreck. And if they can't claim it, if you're basically taking it and retiring it or putting it away, keeping it, in your account. keeping it in your account, you're claiming the green, then they have to go out and buy another one. Wouldn't this be an example of putting a record aside? Exactly. You are all, thanks. Yes, the League of Women Voters this evening is keeping recs away from the utilities by greening this event. So very good. Thank you. So that's, um, getting back to the RPS, that is why increasing the renewable portfolio standard is so important because short of a carbon price, for example, or complete electrification of our transportation sector overnight, or some really transformative, transformational policy, short of that happening like yesterday, the renewable portfolio standard is the one policy, the one tool in our toolbox that we have in place right now that we can ramp up quickly and that will help accelerate the deployment of renewable energy supply. So it's really important. And then this ties to green municipal aggregation, which is the um, community-based um, um, action or community scale action that can be taken to help influence how quickly we accelerate the renewable portfolio standard. So basically renewable, without going into too many details, green aggregation is, as I said, it's your community saying we, our community wants to buy a whole lot more green electricity than we currently do and we want to keep those recs away from the utilities to make sure that they're doing more to get more renewables online. And so we have stumbled, not stumbled, we did some analysis at Mass Energy and um, came to the conclusion that if a community were to purchase at least 5% more class one than what the state currently requires, that's enough to um, be politically feasible in a community. It helps control costs and it helps um, drive the demand for more renewables. And so uh, in about 2014, Melrose and Dedham were the first two communities to pursue this. Since then, many more have uh, begun to explore it. Melrose and Dedham both did 5% above, uh, above the RPS, which basically means their energy supply in 2012, yours and mine is going to be 12%. Theirs is going to be 17%. Actually, mine too, because I live in Melrose. But <laughs> it will be 17%. Next year, it'll be 18. So they're moving faster than even the state policy is currently moving. And what that, um, between, and Brookline is about to move forward with their own project. They're going to have 25% of their electricity supplied with renewable in state or in region renewables. Um, Arlington is another community. Northampton is considering it. Amherst is considering it. There are many. Newton, yes, Newton, yes, Newton is. And um, to give, to put it in a little perspective, all of these communities considering green aggregation is about the same as, as uh, putting 17 new turbines online. 
So it's, it's the same as municipal you have. Yes. Yeah, so you've heard community. You may have heard the term community choice aggregation, municipal aggregation, green municipal aggregation, green community choice aggregation, CCA, GMA, ABCD. <laughs> we speak in acronyms all the time. Um, the green component makes it unique. Any community in Massachusetts can pursue municipal aggregation. That's just basically getting your community to buy power to try to con control costs. The green component is setting that requirement that a certain percentage has to be met with class one resources in Massachusetts. And that is so critical to driving demand here in Mass... In, sorry, I'm just skipping through these because we don't need to cover this right now. Um, that's so critical to driving demand in the region because anything outside of Massachusetts is not going to displace fossil fuels here. It's not going to bring projects online here in New England. It's just going to line the, you know, it's, it's not going to achieve the goal of transitioning to 100% um, renewable energy supply. So that's a green municipal aggregation and the renewable portfolio standard. And I condensing a lot of information in a few short slides because I want to get to a discussion where I'm happy to kind of explore this more. But um, I think the main point is just that um, the transition is possible and the way, the first steps to getting there are this increase in the renewable portfolio standard and the uh, and that is driven both at the state house and in the community. And I forgot to mention one other thing, which is the reason why we're here. Right now, there are about six bills that have been filed at the state house that all deal with an increase in the renewable portfolio standard in one form or another. Six bills, that's a lot. There's an analysis that's currently underway that our organization is um, helping to make happen. And what that's going to do is demonstrate the benefits tied to the renewable portfolio standard, both the, econo or the economic benefits, the emissions impacts, and the price, uh, the price impacts on electricity supply. And once that analysis is done, which will be done in about a week and a half, It'll help the advocates and the broader community figure out what's the right number that we should be targeting in terms of increasing our renewable portfolio standard. We know at least 2% might help us to get to uh, 2050 a little bit faster, get us where we need to be by 2050. But could we be pursuing 3%? Should we be pursuing something more than that, less than that? Are there other states in the region that we need to be pulling along? So the analysis will be really helpful in answering some of of those questions and in telling the story of the renewable portfolio standard and renewable energy projects here in, in the region. But um, without a doubt, the RPS is, is absolutely critical in making the transition happen. Um, so my contact information is up there, and we're about to turn it over to, for questions. I just, David has seen this slide before. Um, Lana mentioned I'm a mom advocate self-described of two little ones. Uh, they are four and a half and uh, one and a half. How old are they? <laughs> um, this is a picture of my daughter. She loves wind turbines. So this is getting coming full circle. This is kind of how I got or why I love doing this work is because I get to kind of mush my, per my personal interests and my professional interests together for the common good, the greater good. But my daughter really, really loves wind turbines. And this is one of our turbines that we buy the wrecks from right here in Massachusetts. It's in Lynn. She got to sign her name on the inside of it. And um, if you ask her, she can tell you all about it, how it works, how it, turns how it turns wind into energy, why she loves turbines, all of those things. But I love that picture because it just reminds me that even though this is a really technical and wonky sounding policy, it's totally accessible. It's in our backyards. And it's something that we can all point to and, and know that we're having an impact and we're bringing these things online. So, you know, you can see the turbine, you can touch the turbine, and then when you go into the state house and advocate for an increase in the RPS, you can know exactly what it is that you're pushing for. So I will leave it there.